All right, so there's two people here in person so far, but uh, hopefully more people will watch the recording. Um, so uh, we finally uh, arrived at the part of the book that actually talks about what goes on during and after a scientific revolution. And the main uh, purpose of this, uh, according to what I was claiming last time, is just to make sure that there's no loophole in which Popper's uh, rational view or view of the progress of science as rational can, can sneak in. <laughs> um, and the loophole would be, so I mean, last time mostly talked about extraordinary science, right? So there's, I guess I'll write these things up again. Normal science, extraordinary science. Revolution. And then back to normal science. Oops. This is not working. There we go. Normal science, extraordinary science, revolution, and then back to normal science. So, um, so last time we saw Kuhn's description of what scientists do in this phase and showed that they have not suddenly woken up and decided to question their presuppositions and take some... Oops. and take some anomalies as counter instances to the paradigm theory and consider it falsified, right? Like none of that stuff is happening. Um, they're trying their hardest to get the old paradigm to work. Um, although at a certain point, and this is when the extraordinary science starts or the start of the second phase of extraordinary science. Anyway, at some point they begin to do it in a kind of random groping way such that, uh, and, and uh, such that the different investigators no longer really agree with each other on what the paradigm is. Um, or maybe such that the fact that they never completely agreed with each other now comes out. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, and then, you know, in the middle of the night, someone suddenly gets a flash, like, oh, here's how to see everything differently. And when we do that, what looked like an anomaly uh, and a counter, not a counter instance, but a, um, an insoluble puzzle now turns out not only to be soluble, but oftentimes to be tautologous, just like, well, obviously, you know. Uh, obviously, oxidation is caused by oxygen. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, so then we have this new paradigm, and eventually everyone migrates over to the new paradigm. So what is the loophole that's left to be closed up in these last two chapters? Well, it basically has to do with the post... I, I, don't, I don't know exactly what is the right period to call revolution and what is post-revolution. Maybe I should say this is the, the period during the revolution. 
uh, that's what seems to be suggested by Kuhn's political analogy at the beginning of chapter 9, which I'll come back to. But in any case, during or after the revolution, we have the new paradigm, and we still have the old paradigm on the table because not everyone has migrated from one to the other. And I guess what you might think is that at this point, right, so remember, like the thing that was going to be tautologous on Kuhn's new paradigm of the history of science or new paradigm of philosophy of science, the thing that was going to be tautologous is that scientists never abandon an old paradigm unless they have a new one to adopt. And it was going to be, that's supposed to be tautologous because if they don't have a paradigm, they're not scientists, right? This paradigm was the answer to the demarcation problem. So if they give up the old paradigm without having a new one to put in its place, they've stopped being scientists or they've stopped doing science or modern science anyway. So, um, but what about now when we have another paradigm on the table? Now can't we see those anomalies as counter instances to the old paradigm? Um, and uh, isn't this the time when we do something like Popper suggests, we say, oh, I see, the old paradigm is falsified and the new paradigm um, is not falsified by that same, those same observations, and so uh, the new one is better. Um, we should accept the new one, at least until new anomalies turn up in, in that one. So, um, so Kuhn's answer to that, I'm, I mean, we already, I already started to talk about this last time, but uh, maybe I should have put it off completely to this time because these are the chapters when he really talks about it. Um, Kuhn's answer to that is that even when the, the old paradigm and the new paradigm are both on the table, um, we can't compare them that way to see which one is better because they're incompatible in a certain way. So, um, let's draw this here. So during or after the revolution, we have the old paradigm and the new paradigm. We want to um, compare them against each other, but we can't because they're incompatible. <laughs> but they're incomparable in a certain way. And the way in which they're incomparable is what Kuhn is going to call incommensurability, right? Incommensurability literally means that two things, like two lengths, can't be measured by the same unit, right? Like the diagonal of a square is incommensurable with the side of the square um, because any unit that that you can use to measure up the side of the square and get a whole number. Uh, um, well, you can't use that same unit to measure up the diagonal. You might think, well, I, you know, can't by just making it smaller, you know, can't I get a whole number for both? But no, you can never do it, right? Because the square root of two is irrational, as we would say. So, um, so that's the, the metaphor here, is that we want to measure the two paradigms by the same standard, but whatever standard works for one won't work for the other one. Of course, I mean, you can tell that the diagonal of the square is longer than the side, even though they're incommensurable. So maybe the metaphor is a little bit... Um, shaky but in any case that's that's what he's saying 
so, um, um, so that's, I think, is the reason why uh, Kuhn is interested in incommensurability. That's the way it comes in. Um, but it's a little confusing because he develops it at first. He develops um, this um, a point about incommensurability at first against um, a cumulative theory. Right, so... Um, So remember, the cumulative theory says, you know, we have the old theory. And then we have the new theory, which is the old theory plus. <laughs> this is the new theory. So the new theory doesn't show that the old theory was wrong, right? That's why this is, he's calling this view cumulative because, you know, as time goes on, we just get more and more right stuff. Um, you know, of course, there are false starts and dead ends, um, but those are the results of error or myth or whatever, right? I mean, those are things that aren't part of the progress of science at all, right? So like phlogiston, since it turns out there is no such thing as phlogiston, and we can't say when was phlogiston discovered, right? When was it added to this accumulation of correct theory? It just gets read out of this development. Um, So, um, so, so Kuhn's, uh, Kuhn first puts the point in terms of that you can't understand as the new, th the new theory as the old theory plus more stuff because um, the new theory uses completely different concepts compared to the ones that were in the old theory. And so, um, um, it can't have any part that's really the same as the old theory. Um, but this is this is confusing for a couple of reasons. But uh, um, mostly. I think because in opposition to the cumulative theory, he's actually in agreement with Popper. Um, so this is this is the stuff that Kuhn discusses um, in the the first part of chapter nine, or um, like not at the very beginning, but the first big part of chapter nine, basically pages nine ninety five through one hundred two, um, and um, and he presents uh, right. So this is the this picture is the cumulative view. And um, and Kuhn identifies this view with logical positivism. Right now, remember, <clears throat> logical positivism is the school of philosophy that Carnap was involved in founding. Um, so, uh, you might think that you could find a critique of Carnap in these pages, um, but actually, uh, as I'll try to point out at the, at the correct place, this, um, 
Carnap doesn't actually hold the kind of quote-unquote logical positivist view that uh, Kuhn is describing. And in a sense, it's no surprise, in a sense, it's no surprise that Kuhn doesn't realize that. The Aufbau wasn't published in English until 1967, I believe. Right? So even later than the logic of scientific discovery, Kuhn uh, had not read it. Uh, but, I mean, he had read later stuff by logical positivists, so he could have. I, I think he did read some of it, so it doesn't completely excuse him. But anyway, I'll, like I said, I'll get back to that. So, um, so, but I'm just going to describe what Kuhn calls a logical positivist, or oftentimes he just says positivist, threat to his view. Um, and the, the so-called positivist view is the view that the old theory, um, in principle, will never be shown to be wrong, insofar as it's a scientific theory. So, um, right, so again, obviously, you can see that Popper and Kuhn are going to be on the same side, right? I mean, Popper is not going to accept a view that says that the old theory can never be shown to be wrong. Um, um, nevertheless, this positivist view that Kuhn attacks is not the same as the conventionalist view that Popper attacked. So I think um, by comparing one to the other, we'll begin to see where Popper and Kuhn do disagree on this topic. But first, let me explain what the positivist view is according to Kuhn. So, um, He describes it using some examples. The first example he uses, and the one I'm going to talk about, is um, uh, Einsteinian science, that is the theory of relativity, and whether it shows that Newtonian dynamics is wrong. So, I mean, we're mostly talking about the special theory of relativity here. I, um, uh, I don't know if it matters that much, but I think that's what he has in mind. The, spe the special theory of relativity as opposed to the Newtonian dynamics in general. The general theory of relativity could be opposed to Newtonian gravitation. Um, but I don't know. Maybe he means both. In any case, um, so this is the argument. Uh, I mean, before this comes a uh, long part where the, the positivist, or not that long, but anyway, it comes a part where the positivist says, look, uh, Newtonian dynamics hasn't been shown to be wrong. It still works in all the cases that it was ever known to work. Um, well, except for the perihelion of mercury or whatever but anyway it, uh, uh, I guess well it was never known to work there so I mean again it, all, it still works in all the cases it was ever known to work in and uh, you know the relativistic corrections only have to be used number one under special circumstances that were never observed before or number two uh, when we measure with special precision that was never uh, attained before. And so, um, and then the conclusion is, if Einsteinian science seems to make Newtonian dynamics wrong, that is only because some Newtonians were so incautious as to claim that Newtonian theory yielded entirely precise results or that was a, it was valid at very high relative velocities. Right, so I mean, this is, I think, is giving a certain substance to the procedure of separating out the, the errors or bad starts or myths or whatever that shouldn't be counted into history. 
so shouldn't be counted as part of the old theory. Um, and it could well be called positivist, although I think logical positivist is probably a misnomer for it, right? And the idea is that the old theory explained certain observations up to a certain degree of precision. And um, that's what the old theory said that was justified. Right, so the old theory said, you know, here is why if, uh, you know, when Galileo did this, that, and the other thing, this is what he saw. Here is why if you look in the sky at a certain time, you'll see a bright spot, you know, whatever. Um, uh, the, the problem was that um, the Newtonians thought that this theory uh, said lots of other stuff besides that. I guess, I mean, I said the, long one, the last one wrong. I should have said, see, here is why when we looked at a certain spot at a certain time uh, on the sky, we saw a bright spot. We saw a comet, right? The theory explains that. So the thing is, Newtonians thought that... Um, um, and I guess I should have added, and we measure the position in the sky, or Galileo measured the velocity of the thing rolling down the plane, inclined plane, or whatever, with a certain precision. So Newtonians thought, number one, that the theory um, uh, in principle could predict what we would have seen if we had measured with any amount of precision. So they attributed that implication to the theory, and they also uh, thought that the theory uh, predicted what we would have seen or what we would or will see now if we make other observations, other measurements that haven't been made yet. Um, but that was just all unjustified. Um, this is, uh, you know, uh, science really is just a shorthand way of describing the sense data we've actually had or the observations we've actually made. You know, it collects them for, um, uh, for convenience into general categories so we can talk about a whole bunch of them together. And, uh, and as far as that goes, it's completely justified, and that's what we should call science. But as, far, as soon as it goes beyond that and starts um, predicting, you know, saying things about observations we never made and maybe never will make, uh, then it's, uh, um, uh, it's really just opinion. It's not knowledge in the sense of episteme. It's not science. So, um, so like I said, you could call this positivist. The original positivists, like Moff, were people who believed that you know science was really just all about our sense data. Um, uh, you could also call it Baconian or Barclian, maybe. Barclay says something like this about science. Um, uh, and um, the result is when you apply it to trying to understand uh, the history of science that... Um, What you had here was the old theory plus various, like, uh, you know, like cruft that was attached to it, various, like, um, unsupported conjectures or, uh, like, um, 
yeah, arrogant overgeneralizations or whatever, but those weren't part of the theory insofar as it was really a scientific theory. And all of that is preserved, and all we've done is get rid of this stuff and add some new things. And of course, unfortunately, people being what they are, they'll immediately start adding more of this stuff, but that's again, is not really part of science. That's the view. So, um, so Kuhn's response to this is in some ways exactly like, maybe I should, I should stop and ask if there's questions about this so far. Do people understand what the position that's being called logical positivist is here? Okay, I got one thumbs up. All right, so uh, one thumb up. Anyway, um, So Kuhn's response to this uh, is in some ways just like Popper's response to what Popper calls conventionalism. The response is that um, there's no inconsistency, there's no logical problem in the activity that the quote unquote logical positivist is discussing. So uh, if someone does that and you wanna call it science, uh, go ahead, you can call that science, but it's not gonna have that special characteristic that makes modern science so successful. Right, so that's what Popper said about conventionalism. Remember he said, I can't, uh, there's, I can't find any inconsistency in applying these stratagems every time uh, the data seem to falsify your theory. I just say that if you do that, um, and you can call it science, words don't mean anything, but if you do that, you're not going to make progress. You're going to be a dogmatist. So it's the same thing that um, Kuhn says here. These prohibitions, so again, the prohibition is the prohibition against saying anything more than your data directly supports. These prohibitions are logically unexceptionable, but the result of accepting them would be the end of the research through which science may develop further. So, um, as I said, this is a lot like Popper. Actually, let me quote one more part of this. Okay, oh uh, yeah, I just skip, wanted to skip this one sentence. Okay. Without commitment to a paradigm, there could be no normal science. Furthermore, that commitment must extend to areas and to degrees of precision for which there is no full precedent. Actually, you know what? Before I read this, to, I didn't write this as well as I could in my notes. All right, so this part, Kuhn and Popper agree about. 100%. The prohibitions are logically unexceptionable, but the results of accepting them would be the end of research through which science may develop further. But the problem, the non-logical problem here is in some sense the opposite of what Popper says it would be. So here's the non-logical problem. Without commitment to a paradigm, there could be no normal science. Furthermore, that commitment must extend to areas and to degrees of precision for which there is no full precedent. If it did not, the paradigm could provide no puzzles that had not already been solved. Right, so the problem, um, um, Popper and Kuhn agree that 
um, a scientific theory to be useful in science as we know it, the kind of science that makes the kind of progress that science makes, um, that to be useful, it may, must make claims that go beyond the data. Um, to use Goodman's term, it has to project, right? Like, it has to say, um, You know, not just that. This a positivist theory would be a theory that explains um, why everything that has been under suitable pressure and bent has bent, <laughs> and why everything that has been under suitable pressure and not bent has not bent. That is, it would explain why all the things that flex, that have flexed, why they flexed and why all the things that failed to flex, failed to flex. Um, and if I now take something else, like a piece of rubber, um, that so far has never been under suitable pressure, and I put it under suitable pressure and it doesn't bend, um, then I can't have shown that the old theory was wrong because the old theory didn't say anything about things that had never been put under suitable pressure. Um, but Popper and Kuhn agree for the theory to be useful as science, it can't, that would be a good positivist theory, but it can't stop there. It has to also talk about things that haven't been observed Right, which is remember from Goodman that involves both uh, attributing dispositional predicates to things like flexible, right? So the theory not only says that rubber that has been put under suitable pressure and bent should have bent, right? But it says that rubber that has never been put under suitable pressure, if it had been put under suitable pressure, would have bent. That's saying that it's flexible, right? And But moreover, uh, that's also um, that kind of commitment beyond the data, as commitment is Kuhn's word here, um, is, I wonder, I'm not sure when the word commitment started becoming so fashionable in philosophy, but this shows that the beginnings of it were earlier than I would, might have thought. Any case, so um, the um, that kind of commitment beyond the data is also what leads to induction and its problems, right? So uh, um, I, I predict that future observations of this piece of rubber or another piece of rubber by putting them under suitable pressure will also cause, cause them to bend. Um, but the question is, um, why does, this, does the theory have to be able to do this in order to be usable as a scientific theory? Um, and, um, and what's the connection between that and making progress? So Popper says, the theory has to make bold claims in order to risk being wrong. Because progress will be made when we're forced to give up our theory because we see that it's wrong. Right? So, um, um, whereas, Explaining this kind of backwards. Right, so I guess, I mean, so put it this way. So Popper will see the boldness in this picture as lying in the fact that I make some uh, universal statements 
I say something like all rubber, if it is put under suitable pressure, bends. Um, and uh, I, I allow myself to say that even though my data only show that the following pieces of rubber have been put under suitable pressure and have bent. That is my, my um, well, okay, that's, that's as much I want to say about that. Um, and, and the reason that's useful for progress, again, is because although um, uh, I've had some tests of that universal statement, and it passed those tests, otherwise why would I want to accept it? Um, there's a lot more tests that it hasn't passed yet, and I can start subjecting it to those tests, and I'll make progress when I realize, no, I have to give up that universal statement. Whereas Kuhn says, um, Kuhn sees the boldness here as a boldness not on, of making extremely universal statements, but as a boldness of adopting extremely rigid conceptual boxes. Right? In saying something like all rubber is flexible, um, I've accepted the idea that insofar as bending under suitable pressure goes, uh, rubber is a relevant kind of thing. Or in other words, as Goodman would say, that is rubber is a projectable predicate or something like that. And um, I've uh, accepted the theory, right? So, you know, if I divide everything into the kinds of things that are either flexible or not, then all I have to decide is which ones are flexible and which ones aren't. That's what my theory is supposed to tell me. So I've accepted the theory that this particular box labeled rubber is a box of flexible things. Now, um, um, now my problem will be to uh, take difficult cases of rubber pieces of rubber that are hard to bring under suitable pressure, or pieces of rubber that seem to be under suitable pressure but aren't bending, or whatever, um, and uh, um, work to get the observations and the theory to match each other. So with this piece of rubber out here, the piece of rubber that's never been under suitable pressure yet, Popper predicts that what I'm going to do is see if it's a counter instance, right? That is, this is easy, subject it to suitable pressure, see if it's a counter instance to all rubber is flexible. And if it is, well, okay, maybe you need more than one instance, blah, 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 a few like, uh, articulations of the theory to avoid anomalies but you know but basically uh, um, if it turns out that it's not flexible that's a counter instance and it's you know it's on such grounds that I'm going to reject my theory that all rubber is flexible according to Kuhn what I'm going to do with this rubber out here that's never been put under suitable pressure yet is try to figure out how to put it under suitable pressure, number one. So that might be hard, right? Maybe this piece of rubber is, you know, part of a building or something, and I can't just take it out, and right? So I'm, you know, like going to have to try to invent new techniques to put this under suitable pressure. Um, number two, you know, um, um, if it, 
and uh, actually, according to Kuhn, uh, you know, my theory, if it's any good, is probably going to start out with problems with this already. You know, uh, I guess I should draw it again. Here's a piece of rubber that failed to flex, apparently. Right. So even when my theory was first proposed, there were already anomalies. My theory was that, that rubber is flexible, is one of the flexible things, you know, and I had everything categorized as either flexible or is not flexible, but I knew full well that there were things that seemed to be rubber and seemed to be under suitable pressure and didn't seem to be bending. But I said, you know, that's a problem for further work, right? So, um, so in this case, or in this, in this case, if it seems like it, it fails the test, it doesn't flex once I set up my complicated apparatus, or with this case that I knew to begin with, you know, didn't seem to be failing to flex. Um, you know, I regard those as problems. So I, theoretical and or observational problems. So I ask, you know, whether my apparatus is really working right, uh, whether there are some other factors that I didn't take into account. So that's getting kind of like more on the theoretical side, like maybe the paradigm has to be articulated to see, say more clearly what it means to subject something to suitable pressure. Of course, it doesn't count as subjecting to suitable pressure if there's a steel beam right next to it so it can't bend, you know, whatever, something like that. Uh, like, uh, you know, you have to understand what under suitable pressure means better. That's articulation of the paradigm theory. Um, you know, uh, maybe uh, I have to determine more precisely what the threshold of suitable pressure is. Right? So maybe when I do this test, uh, I mean, in general, when I do this test one way or another, I'm not going to be looking at it as if I was looking for a counter instance. One way I could be looking at it is I'm measuring this constant of nature. What is this? What is the suitable pressure constant? <laughs> you know, such that everything that's under that pressure and is flexible bends. Um, right, so all those things are the kind of things normal scientists will do, according to Kuhn. And um, first of all, that's why it can't be a scientific theory if it only says non-anomalous things about the data we've actually observed. Um, uh, because then it would be... Um, a completely solved problem and there would be nothing for scientists to do. There would be no puzzles. And number two, it couldn't make progress in the way Kuhn thinks science makes progress because it wouldn't have that characteristic of being super sensitive to anomalies, to obscure anomalies that we wouldn't usually notice. Okay, there's a question here. Now I'm curious, what would be their response if they saw two people flexing the same metal bar? Okay, so flexing, remember, the way Goodman uses it is something the metal bar does, not something I do to it. Flex means the metal bar is under suitable pressure and it bends. Um, Okay, so anyway, where the first person couldn't flex the bar, but the second, right, so that we say the first person couldn't, I mean, I guess you could say flex should be like bend. Bend has a transitive use and an intransitive use in English. Uh, right, where the first person couldn't flex the bar, that is, couldn't bend it under suitable pressure, but the second person could flex the same bar, would the bar be considered to flex or not to, or fail to flex. Um, well, the, I mean, um, so like on Popper's view, suppose, I mean, I've been talking about the, the theory that rubber is flexible. Suppose we have a theory that metal is not flexible or at least this kind of metal is not flexible. 
Um, so at least this this thick a piece of this kind of metal is not flexible or whatever. Um, so now we have one person putting pressure on it and it's bending. So that piece flexes because it's under suitable pressure. At least, well, okay, assume that person is putting it under suitable pressure and it's bending. So that piece is flexing because it's under suitable pressure and it's bending. The other piece is, let's say, under suitable pressure, but it's not bending, so it fails to flex. So if my theory is that all metal of this type in this shape is inflexible, then according to Popper, we have um, one corroborating instance, namely the person who put it under suitable pressure and it didn't bend, that's what my theory predicts. But we have also have one counter instance where one pers person, another person is putting under suitable pressure, but it's not bending. So, I mean, but it is bending, so it does flex, and therefore it is flexible, and it's a counter instance to my theory that this metal is not flexible. So, um, you know, that's what Popper would say about it. Now, of course, if it's just that one person, we might say, well, that's a stray observation. Maybe that person was super strong and was able to put it under more than suitable pressure. Maybe that person was uh, like a magician, you know, like or like a psychic, you know, like like a fraudulent psychic, right? Like Uri Geller, or, you know, who, who claimed that he could make spoons bend with his mind, right? It's like, you know, maybe it's a trick. It's a trick metal. It's, you know, they diverted my attention and whatever. But, you know, if it happens enough, if there's falsifying hypothesis, we'll have to reject the theory. That's what Popper would say. That's, that is, that's what Popper would, would predict or at least prescribe for scientists to do in order to be scientists. So Kuhn is going to say, no, in order to be scientists, this is how scientists should react. Well, that's a puzzle. Now, again, if it's just that one time, they might say, well, I don't know, let's wait for more observations, and that will be the result, the resolution of the puzzle for now. And this does happen. I can, you know, I can attest from my brief time in science that, like, when observers produce really surprising observations, theorists' first response is often, um, let's, say if, let's see if that effect sticks around before we start trying to explain it, because a lot of times it doesn't, right? It can't be replicated. So why waste time trying to explain it? So, um, you know, uh, so anyway, that might be their, their first response. But, you know, again, if this crops up enough or if they trust this particular observer enough or whatever, then people will start saying, well, okay, that's a puzzle. Um, and then they'll go into all those things that... Um, I was discussing before, and the result will be, so in the first case, the result will be, um, if they're successful, that the theory will be falsified, that we'll know that not all metal is, is inflexible, and we'll have a new, better theory. In the Kuhn point of view, the success will be when they show that the theory that all metal is inflexible can account for the bending one, too, somehow. And, right, so um, um, so it'll be occasion for congratulation, but not for surprise. Right, like if I got a jigsaw puzzle in a box, and let's say two different people got the same jigsaw puzzle, and one was able to solve it, and the other just couldn't, we would say, well, that's weird. I wonder why they can't solve it. <laughs> um, and the, or yeah, the analogy is not really good. Um, should I say it's two different puzzles? Let's say it's two different puzzles. One person got a jigsaw puzzle and solved it. The other person got a jigsaw puzzle and didn't solve it. So instead of saying, oh, I see, the rules of jig jigsaw puzzle solving are refuted, 
They can't all be solved following these rules. We say, oh, I guess that puzzle was too hard for that person. Let's see if we can solve it. And when we do solve it, um, it will be occasion for congratulation and not for surprise. Did that, I hope that answered the question about flexing and not flexing. I probably said more about it than I should have, but uh, I don't remember it, but okay, well, whatever. So, um, Right, so I mean, so again, Popper and Kuhn agree that ultimately these bold extra claims are going to lead to progress because they're going to make the theory or the paradigm in Kuhn's case vulnerable. Um, but it's just the way they do it is different. And, and the difference is, is key to the difference of, about whether science is a rational activity or not basically, whether it's a free activity. Because according to Popper, the reason these bold claims make it possible for, or the reason scientists accept theories that make these bold claims is because they know that these bold claims are risky and they want to make risky claims because they want their theory to be possibly falsified. Because when your theory is falsified, that's how you learn something new about the world. Namely, that that theory has to be rejected and let's try a new one. But according to Kuhn, um, the reason scientists like these bold claims is because they know they assume without question that these bold claims are true. Um, or at least that the theory properly understood can be made to say the right thing about all these cases that are outside my data. They assume that without question. And they like these those additional claims, the bolder the better, because those additional claims are what give them their job of puzzle solving to reconcile the theory with observations and all these other more difficult cases. And it's just a byproduct of that, not something they wanted at all. It's a byproduct of that, that, um, um, that sometimes a puzzle will be so hard that they can't solve it, that a crisis will result, and then after that, someone will introduce a new theory. So, um, So the result, however, in both cases for Popper and Kuhn is that this cumulative view will not be true. The old theory always um, claims to explain some cases out here that haven't been observed. It was part of the old theory, these predictions or um, uh, or these uh, conceptualizations, these projections, are part and parcel of the old theory, and um, and one of at one of these points, so, I'm not surprised, but right. So right, this is this is the positivist version of the old theory, that thick box, right? The one that only talks about the observations we've already made. Kuhn and Popper agree the old theory is never confined to that. It always contains another part that projects beyond the observations we've already made. And um, the new theory, um, at a minimum, is going to um, explain why the old theory failed in this case. Yeah. <sighs>
I don't, I don't know if my drawing still makes any sense, but, <laughs> but what I'm saying here is that according to both Popper and Kuhn, there's a part of the old theory which is not preserved in the new theory. The new theory says the opposite of what the old theory said. So, for example, if the old theory is Newtonian dynamics, you know, um, it says that uh, if you apply a constant force to a body, uh, eventually it will reach any arbitrary relative velocity to its starting place. Right? You know, so if, if you started it off on the ground and now you apply a constant force, you know, I mean, I don't know what force that is. You know, if you started it off here and you apply a constant force to it, then it will accelerate, accelerate, accelerate. And for any arbitrary velocity I, you know, you name, I can find a place on its trajectory where it will be going that fast. So, you know, if you do that to an electron and a particle accelerator, you'll find that no matter how long you will keep applying the same force to it, uh, it will get closer and closer to being the speed of light relative to your accelerator, but will never quite get there and certainly will never get higher. So, um, right, so the... Kuhn's positivist says the old theory really wasn't talking about what happens in part to electrons in particle accelerators because no one had ever observed that and they had no right to talk about it. Um, so the new theory says that electrons in particle accelerators, you know, do this other thing and the new theory is right. It doesn't contradict the old theory. It just adds something to it. But Kuhn and Popper both agree that no, the old theory, the Newtonian theory, did really include this bold prediction that no matter how long you keep applying a force to something, it will keep getting faster and faster. And so I promised, boy, well, I'm kind of behind my schedule here, but I, this is important enough that I should mention it. Um, so, because I promised to say why this position is not really logical positivism. And I mean, it's actually pretty easy to see why it's not logical positivism. Because remember, the logical positivists felt that they needed scientific theories needed to be able to include dispositional terms and they needed to be able to include claims that go beyond the present data. Remember I kept emphasizing that even in the Aufbau, the strict verificationist view of the Aufbau, the um, um, the idea that every statement of science can be translated into a statement about the data I actually have, I being the autopsychological subject who's you know carrying out this constitution, that that depended on the fiction that all my observations for my whole life were already in. In real life, that's never true, right? So even in the Aufbau. Carnap is making sure that scientific statements say things beyond the observations that I actually have. They say things about all the observations I will ever have. In the Aufbau, he still wants to keep the, it, what they're talking about finite. So that's why he wants to say it's all the observations I will ever have and my life is finite. Right, and as you remember in the, uh, as you may remember in the methodological character paper, which is late, he still wants to imp to impose some kind of um, finitism on the observation language, even though now it's no longer autopsychological. You know, he still wants to say the observation language shouldn't imply that there are infinitely many objects in the universe or whatever. Um, so, I mean. That's why he limits it to in the Aufbau to my experience. But the limit to my experience is not a limit to currently available data because it includes all the data that will ever be part of my experience. 
Right. So, and, you know, certainly going on, the whole reason that Carnap got interested in dispositional predicates and inductive logic and whatever is precisely because he, you know, he didn't think a scientific theory could count as a scientific theory if it only discussed the particulars we've already or, or have actually observed. Um, now, I mean, of course, that did cause problems for positivism. Um, I mean, you could say, and I don't have time to try to back this up, but you could say something like this, that Quine claims that positivists are really should be committed to what Popper calls conventionalism. Um, that is, they, you know, they should insist that all statements of universal law be analytic or something like that. Um, and uh, Goodman, on the other hand, is claiming that positivists really should be committed to what Kuhn calls positivism. Um, that is, I guess you could say, you know, Quine says that positivists have no principled way to draw a limit between analytic and synthetic between true by definition and empirically true. And Goodman says they have no way in principle to draw a line between projectable and not projectable. Um, but, um, but be that as it may, those are problems for positivism. That's not something that positivists uh, regarded as the correct outcome, right? So again, so that cumulative positivist view that Kuhn is, dis Kuhn is discussion is not actually the view of the logical positivists. Which just goes to show the thing I've been claiming all along that uh, Kuhn is not really engaged. The view of science he's criticizing or attacking is not really Carnap's view of science. It's really Popper's. Um, Let's see how much time I have left and whether, because I want to discuss an example that might make it clearer what the difference between Popper and Kuhn is here. And I'm wondering what I'm going to have to skip if I do this. I'm going to have to skip that, but um, uh, basically what I wanted to discuss is uh, um, the difference, what one of Popper's conventionalists would say um, faced with the evidence, you know, that it's not true that all planets move in a circle around, a circular orbit around the Earth versus what Kuhn's positivists would say. So they wouldn't say the same thing. And if you, if you think about that, you can see how they're different from each other. Um, you know, the conventionalist is going to start with, it's true by definition that all planets move in a circular orbit around the Earth. And use that to show that it hasn't been falsified, no matter what Galileo or Kepler or whatever have seen or, or theorized. Um, Whereas the Kuhn's positivist is going to say that the real theory was that planets look like they're going in a circular orbit around the Earth. Right? That if you look at them from here, it will seem like they're going in a circular orbit around the Earth. Um, but they never said anything about what they would look at. If you went into space and looked at them from another point of view or whatever, um, you know, and similarly with issues of precision or, you know, so in any case, that's how the positivist is going to say that the old theory wasn't falsified. Um, right. So, so again, that's a way of seeing that although Popper and Kuhn are both criticizing a view that makes the old theory immune 
to being rejected by new evidence, the way that you're doing it and the reason that you're doing it is is different for each of them. Um, uh, that is um, because the the op the opposing point that they're trying to make is different. But I think I already said enough abstractly about how the opposing point they're trying to make is different, and I'm going to go on. Um, So incommensurability, I shouldn't have erased that name. Well, I guess, does incommensurability have one M or two M's? I spelled it here. It should have two, right? I think this is a misspelling. It must have two M's because one is from the con, the, the con, and one is from the measurability. All right. All right. Anyway, um, so uh, so um, the way if you if if you think back to the um, what's going to happen in the rubber. So we, um, so we had divided everything into flexible and inflexible. And we also have this kind of things called rubber. This well, and we want to know, and we wanted to know which side of the flexible, inflexible line does rubber go on. So um, we knew some cases that were clearly on the flexible side. We had some anomalous cases that seemed to be on the inflexible side. As normal science goes on, what we try to do is correct these cases and move them over to the to the flexible side, and also um, any new cases that that well we try, we try which may be hard to collect new cases on the flexible side, and any new cases that end up seem to end up on the inflexible side, we'll also try to move that there, right? So that's whole thing is the is the progress of normal science, um, but eventually we find a piece of rubber. Uh, you know, somewhere on this side, either it could be an anomaly that's been known since the beginning, or it's a newly discovered anomaly. But, you know, we work and we work and work and try to get it back to the other side. You know, I mean, the, the, I guess you could think of the observational part of the scientist's work as this part. And you could think of the theoretical part as trying to, like, change this line to get the thing in, right? But so that's, but that's why Kuhn says sometimes it's hard to tell which one, you know, they work together to solve this problem. But eventually it get, we get a case where we can't do that. Everyone fixates on it. The best scientists in the field are working on it for a long time. They can't um, get it to go away. Now maybe then what happens is we say, I guess this case is too hard, we'll put it aside for further study. But maybe in the middle of the night, someone says, you know, you drew the lines wrong. Right, there aren't only two kinds of things, flexible and inflexible. You know, there are three kinds of things. <laughs> um, or, um, Rubber is not one kind of not one kind for these purposes. There's this kind of rubber and that kind of rubber. Right? So so the, the paradigm shift can involve 
changing the way I draw lines through the universe of all things, right? Or all events, all observable events, whatever. And that amounts to changing concepts. Um, right, if you remember that a concept is like, if I say S is P, then S and P are the concepts, right? So if I say rubber is flexible, then this is the proposition, the judgment, the statement. These are the concepts, like rubber and flexible. So when I draw the lines differently, Um, all the things that I used to call rubber no longer belong to a single concept, let's say. So, um, I no longer have a concept like rubber to plug into the subject box. So my new theory doesn't talk about rubber. It doesn't say anything about rubber. It can't, can't make any statements about rubber because rubber is no longer one of the conceptual boxes that's available. Um, so, um, um, Right? This is not the kind of change that Popper thinks there should be. Right? Popper thinks that when the old theory was falsified, I shouldn't try to get around it by changing my concepts. I should say that that judgment I made using those concepts was false. Reject it, right? Like rubber is flexible. That is, all rubber is flexible. I should say, not all rubber is flexible. <laughs> Whereas Kuhn says, the way scientists actually react in this case is not to say some rubber is not flexible, but just to say rubber isn't a thing, so to speak. Right, so like, for example, you know, um, the, the, the phlogiston theory um, said that all metals are a compound of, a metal is a compound of some earth with phlogiston. Um, so, uh, and that's what makes it a metal, that it contains phlogiston. Um, the new theory doesn't say that uh, um, metals do not contain phlogiston. The new theory doesn't say anything about phlogiston. Phlogiston is no longer a thing. Or maybe a more subtle example, right? That, you know, the old theory says um, um, all planets orbit around the Earth. The new theory says all planets orbit around the Sun. Um, what about the Moon? The new theory says the Moon isn't a planet. <laughs> right? So although the same word planet is being used, the concept planet is not the same as it used to be. It doesn't draw the lines the way they were drawn by the, in the old paradigm. The line that, you know, um, the line that used to go between on one side we had the earth and on the other side we had the moon, the sun, Venus, etc. This used to be the line, planets, not a planet, right? Now the line is, the moon is 
not a planet, and the Earth and the Sun is not a planet, and the Earth is a planet. Right, so the line has been drawn in a different place through the universe. Um, so the concept planet that's used by the new theory is not the same as the concept planet that's used by the old theory. Now, I mean, this is like, this kind of thing, as I said, is already something that Popper would say shouldn't really be going on. Right? It's not, he, he emphasizes, it's not the concepts that matter. It's the statements that matter. It's words don't matter. Concepts don't matter. The question is whether you put them together in such a way as to say something that A, could be falsified. <laughs> and then the question is, has it been falsified? As long as you make sure to take care of those things, is it falsifiable and is it falsified, then you can use whatever concepts you want. But in fact, a big part of the change, Kuhn is saying just as a historical matter, a big part of the change from one paradigm to a successor is that the concepts change. So just in that literal sense, it's already true that the people on both sides of the divide are talking past each other. They aren't making directly comparable statements. When one of them says planets move around the sun, they aren't actually expressing the negation uh, or an alternative. Uh, a direct alternative to what the other one is saying when they say planets move around the earth because they're not talking about the same bodies when they say planets. But um, um, once you've seen that, Kuhn says, you can notice that um, the extension of, con of concepts, the way those lines are drawn, um, is not the only thing that changes when the paradigm shifts. And in fact, there's some more uh, fundamental kinds. Because, I mean, if it were just that kind, you know, you could say, well, okay, I mean, yes, they need a translation manual to talk to each other. But still, I mean, obviously, uh, the new statement that all planets move around the sun, meaning that Mercury, Venus, the Earth, Mars, and Jupiter, and Saturn move around the sun, uh, does contradict the old theory saying that all planets move around the Earth, meaning the moon, the sun, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn move around the Earth, because there's an overlap where they both make a claim and they make opposite claims, and one of them is right and the other one isn't. And you might think that this kind of incommensurability is relatively trivial to deal with. But that's, I think, why Kuhn, um, uh, doesn't, uh, is not satisfied with just talking about this kind of incommensurability. He says that, um, the different paradigms have, number one, different standards um, um, they differ about standards and methods. What counts as a good observation and what doesn't? Um, what counts as an explanation and what doesn't? Right, so he has an example from the beginning of modern mechanism where, you know, where the, like, um, like natural, attractive, and repulsive faculties of various things for Aristotelians, or at least Galenic Aristotelians, uh, um, counted as like a prime example of an explanation. Um, and in fact, uh, Galen already mentions magnets and, uh, and, um, uh, what they was called electron in Greek that is amber, right? Which can, under certain circumstances, will attract wood chips. 
right? In other words, mag magnetism and electricity are already among Galen's, I'm filling in things I know that Kuhn doesn't mention, are already among Galen's example of this kind of attractive force that explains things everywhere in nature. Mechanists came along and said, what kind of explanation is that? I don't understand what these mysterious faculties of attraction and repulsion and other things things like dormitivity or whatever are. Um, so uh, that doesn't count as an explanation. Now you have to tell me like what body pushed this body and made it move. That's an explanation. But then with Newtonian science, well, it turns out eh, after a little while of working on certain puzzles, yeah, well, actually, we think that an attractive faculty is a good explanation, right? And that's what allows not only Newtonian gravitation, but the, so to speak, Newtonian theories of electricity and magnetism to be developed. Um, you know, by Coulomb and whatever, right? We say, oh, gravity isn't the only attractive or repulsive force. There's also electricity and magnetism. So um, so now you start to see how the two theories, the, the old paradigm and the new paradigm people, um, they have a problem that can't be solved just by a translation manual, right? Because one of them will say, well, how do you explain this? Your theory can't account for this, and mine does, so mine is better. And the other one will say, that's not an explanation. Your theory doesn't explain that because what you just said isn't an explanation, right? So it wasn't just that the theory or the concepts in terms of which the theory is stated that changed, but the standards of what counts as an explanatory success have changed. So, um, so uh, the people attached to the new paradigm with its new theory uh, don't have any, there, there's no neutral standard for them both to appeal to, the old paradigm people and new paradigm people. And Kuhn extends this in chapter 10 uh, and um, um, brings it to the point of, uh, as he admits, sounding paradoxical, uh, shocking, by saying that, um, moreover, the old paradigm people and new paradigm people don't even live in the same world. Um, now, what does he mean by that? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> um, it, it obviously, as Kuhn knows, I think, and admits, makes him sound like a uh, what's known as a cognitive relativist, right? Saying there is no one way that the world is um, such that you can ask, is the old paradigm, are the old paradigm people right about it? Or are the new paradigm people right about it? Rather, you know, um, you can only talk about rightness relative to a paradigm, and the old paradigm is right by its standards, and the new paradigm is right by its standards. And if you say, hold on, hold on, the old paradigm is not right by its standards, what about this anomaly? Well, the answer is there are always anomalies. The new paradigm must have anomalies or, you know, untackled puzzles as well, or else it wouldn't be a good scientific paradigm. So um, um, uh, that doesn't show that the old paradigm is wrong by its standards. The old paradigm, you know, I mean, say the old paradigm goes on in the way it could have, if would have, if the new paradigm hadn't been thought of and says, this problem is too hard, we're going to save it for future research. It goes on doing things the same way. It's done the right thing by its own standards. 
But by the new paradigm standards, it's done the wrong thing because by the new paradigm standards, the old thing it was doing what didn't count as explanation, didn't use the right concepts, and moreover, even its observations don't count. And not just because, although this is part of it, we change our views about what instruments are reliable, about what kind of observations are interesting, right? In that sense, change our view about what counts as an observation, but we actually see different things. So, um, you know, and there's two types of examples Kuhn gives of this. One is a favorite example of his about uh, um, chaff that uh, like, um, uh, sticks to something that, as we would say, has a static charge on it and then falls off. So we would say it falls off because it becomes electrically charged in the same way as the, um, the thing that it's stuck to was. And now instead, of, so I guess, I don't know exactly how this works, but I guess we say the chaff had, let's say, had a, a, sl a small positive charge and it's sticking to a thing that has a big negative static charge, what happens is that in the end, the chaff will have a negative charge. And now it, instead of being attracted to the big negative charge thing, it's repulsed and it goes away. But, you know, Kuhn says the mechanists who didn't believe in attractive and repulsive forces looked at the same thing and said, oh, the chaff bounces off. They were seeing exactly the same thing, but the description that the new paradigm could give of it wasn't a type of description that they could give of it. So they described it using the concepts they had available, right? And similarly, he talks about how Aristotelians, he admits this is a weird example because Aristotelians, I guess, never, until Aristotelianism was already, had already been modified, Aristotelians never talked about a stone swinging on the end of a chain. Uh, I'll assume he's right about that. I don't know. I haven't read everything that Aristotelians ever wrote, but you know. But he says so. This, but how they would have talked about it, right? I guess you could say this is an example of of Kuhn's theory going beyond his observations and making a counterfactual claim. What would Aristotelians have said about it? They would have said the stone is falling under constraint. And it isn't able to uh, reach rest immediately because of the constraints. So it's forced to take a kind of convoluted path until it reaches rest. Right? Whereas Galileo, looking at the same thing, said, oh, the stone is, is swinging back and forth. Kuhn summarizes this by calling it a pendulum. A pendulum really just means something hanging from it something right so I but in any case you know Galileo looks at it and says oh a thing that's swinging back and forth potentially forever except you know somehow something eventually slows it down and it stops so they see two different things here so they that's why they make different measurements and they're interested in different features of it and they arrive at different theories of it and so forth um, that's one example, but another example, which is in some ways even more um, I don't know, anomalous, I guess you would say, from like for someone who wanted Popper's view to work out. Kuhn says, you know, after so because of Dalton's work, chemists at a certain point began to view the law of fixed proportions in chemical mixture as tautologous, right? A chemical mixture is a mixture where um, the, you know, um, atoms that made up the two ingredients get assorted with each other in a different way to form a new kind of molecule. And of course, every molecule can only contain a whole number of atoms of each type. So at least if you have two pure substances and you have like one unequivocal reaction that they undergo when you mix them, then uh, uh, 
you know, the new molecules will have exactly a certain whole number of atoms of each type. And in order to get that in the original ingredients, you have to have a certain, um, um, you have to have a multiple of a certain number of atoms of each type in that mixture. And that means that you, that the weights of the ingredients if the, if the reaction goes all the way through and there's nothing left, the rates of the ingredients have to be in a whole number ratio to each other, right? So like in a simple case, you know, I combine oxygen and hydrogen and I get water. So the water molecules ha each have one atom of oxygen and two atoms of hydrogen. The ingredients had molecules with two atoms of oxygen and molecules with two atoms of hydrogen. So, uh, you know, um, so I'm basically going to need to combine two of these with one of these to get two of these. So however much a hydrogen molecule weighs, I need two times that amount, uh, or two times you know some number times that amount. And however much an oxygen molecule weighs, I need one times the same number some times that amount. So every time this re reaction goes on, I'm, I'm getting confused trying, I mean not confused, but I'm getting confusing, I guess, trying to explain this in all the detail. But you understand, right, in general, why this is going to tell you that things have to mix together in certain proportions. They can't just, if if I just, if I take a certain amount of hydrogen, let me put it this way, if I have a certain amount of hydrogen and I react it with a certain amount of oxygen and there's none left, it's all water now, that means I used up all the hydrogen molecules and all the oxygen molecules. So if I try to take that same amount of hydrogen and react it with more oxygen, there's going to be some oxygen left. So there's fixed proportions where you have to mix things with to get the mixture to go all the way through. So Kuhn says that um, after chemists accepted that, the observational data changed. What does he mean by that? It's kind of a shocking way to put it, but it's true in a sense, at least, I mean, assuming his historical information is correct, which I have no reason to doubt. So, you know, what happened was before, there were some uh, observations that seemed to violate this. Right, where it, it seemed like some reactions didn't go through fixed proportions. Um, so, I mean, some of those were ruled out as not being chemical reactions at all. That's the example of the other kind of like incommensurability we were discussing before. But some of them, uh, what happened was people uh, tried again to make observations more carefully. And they did it until they came out right. So the like, um, if you looked up in a table of how carbon combines with oxygen or whatever before and after the paradigm change, you would find that the numbers have changed. Now, I mean, why is this? Does, does Kuhn claiming that this is magic or something? That by you know by adopting a new paradigm, they made their instruments behave differently, or is he claiming that it's fraud? You know that uh, that uh, they fudged their data to make it right. Um, I mean. Uh, the first kind of thing presumably doesn't happen. <laughs> the second kind of thing does happen. I mean, I think like we, we know now that, for example, Kepler, because he didn't know about perturbations, like fudged his data a little bit to make it uh, the orbits perfect ellipses. <laughs> um, you know, but um, um, 
but that's not what Kuhn is talking about. Kuhn says in this case, he's talking about careful observers and even ones who are more inclined than most to, you know, who were going to be more ready to accept the new paradigm when it came. But he says, you know, what explains this? It's hard to get a paradigm. It's hard to get a paradigm to match the world. You have to work hard. There's hard puzzles to solve. Without the paradigm that says you must find this kind of result, this is the conceptual box. And if you can't do it, it's going to be your failure. And if you can do it, it's going to be occasion for congratulations, though not for surprise. Right? Without that paradigm, there's no... I mean, the same observations could have been made before the paradigm change. If people had worked a little bit harder and a little bit care more carefully, I think Kuhn is willing to admit that, yeah, they would eventually have reached those other numbers, but there was no incentive for it because there was nothing wrong with the numbers they had. There was no puzzle. Right? So, but that means that um, because things like that always happen in the paradigm shift, that there's not only is there no um, agreed upon language to speak in or agreed upon standards to appeal to, there's no agreed upon body of data that we can test the theories against. Okay, now um, there's a very important note I want to add to this about Kuhn's comparison between this and political change, but I don't have time for that this time, so obviously I will talk about it at the beginning next time, and I, which is our last lecture, and uh, I'll see you then. Bye.